Hi, welcome to Linden Tree Wood Carving. I'm Kevin Baxter. What I'm going to show you today is how to carve a, um, an ice fish decoy. Well, the first thing that we need to look at when we're going to carve is what kind of wood we're going to use. What I've chosen today for this project is white pine. And white pine can be obtained in most lumber yards. The thing is, most of what you're going to get is going to be um, building grade lumber. And I'm going to show you a difference. This is a typical 2x4. This is something that uh, you're going to see an awful lot of. It's going to have knots in it, it's going to have chips in it, it's going to be just kind of big, wide grain, and it's just, it's junk. You know, a lot of people uh, um, tell me that they, uh, they carve and they say, well, I went and got a piece of pine, because pine's soft, but this is not a good piece. This, on the other hand, is still white pine, and I bought it at the lumber yard. And out of that piece, there was a few knots out of an eight-foot piece, but a lot of it was, was a straight grain and clear. I could get enough good pieces out of that to make my projects I wanted to make. There's also a big difference in the grain. If you notice, what little bit of grain shows here um, there's real fine lines in here, and uh, this grain is very, very coarse. And so, um, I guess we'll do it this way. So we can stand those up, show that. See, quite a, it's a very obvious difference. This knot's a lot tighter, and I'm going to work around that. It's not going to show. So that's something we want to look for. We really need a grain, and the, and the growth rings will show you also in any kind of lumber that you use. The growth rings here are very wide, and the growth rings here are very tight. So any kind of wood really for carving that's suitable to carve is going to be wood that's fine grained, very tight, and uh, the grain is nice and straight. So out of that, <clears throat> I took a piece. Now, this is one of that piece, and it's got a knot in it. I'm not worried about that because it's in the, in the waste area. It has a, a broken edge, but I'm not going to worry about that because in the waste area, I was able to plan around it. So I've drawn my pattern on the top and I draw my pattern on the side. And um, then we take it to the bandsaw, and if you're not familiar with the bandsaw, um, it's just a big two-wheel saw with a, with a large band, really, it's a saw blade. Um, you can do this on a jigsaw, you could do a hand jigsaw, you could do a coping saw. And uh, what I did was I cut the top view out first, I stood it in there and just cut cut this area out and this area and this area and this area, and I had enough flat area that when I stood it up and did the sides, I could take these out. So this is what I got, and I took the top and bottom off, and there is my fish decoy that we're going to be working on. So we'll set these aside. We're going to save these because we're going to use these later. So first thing I want to do now is Understanding the wood grain, when you, if you've never carved before, and I'm going to assume that you haven't, some of you have, but if you have, um, this will make sense. Wood grain, in any kind of a tree, when you see those growth rings, it grows from the bottom of the tree up, and uh, it's drawing nutrients up through that tree. And the grain is like, even though it's in rings, if you could look at it through a microscope, it would be like a bunch of tiny little drinking straws all stacked together or wrapped together. So if you took one, wrapped a bunch around that, wrapped a bunch around that in rows, you'd have sort of a large scale um, version of what the grain is like. So when we, if we take those, that bundle of straws and try to cut into them, we can cut them straight off like with a saw, but if you try to carve that way, which is like carving the end grain, it doesn't cut well that way. What we have to do is we have to shave off of it. We're going to go from, from one edge and shave off. But what we have to do, like I want to show you here, this grain, for instance, is going through the board this direction. So I've kept it pretty straight. It's not always that straight. Here it kind of fools you, but you can see it a little bit in here. When I carve, I need to carve from this high point and carve that direction. 
because that's where it's, it's cut off that direction. So we're gonna shave, take a cut out of this area and this area and this area, we're gonna keep working our way down. But if I were to cut clear from, from, from clear back here on up, what happens is my knife grabs, see, and this wants to break. I've come back too far. But when you come to that, from that point and you're shaving away from that grain, as that grain runs out of the board, from this point, he runs out, runs out, runs out, that's telling me that's the direction I want to go. Then when I cut, my chips just come off in nice clean curls. And same thing here. See, they come out. It's not, it's not grabbing. If I come back here now, see how that split? It grabs and wants to just tear off. Now it's not going to hurt anything at this point. But as you're carving, if you come back too far, that's an indication right there that you're going against the grain. You've gone back, you, the grain is grabbed, and it's going to break out. We don't want it to break out. So we're going to work from this point, this direction, and this point, this direction. Same thing down here. As the grain, wherever the grain kind of runs out of the board, it gives me a starting point. I'm going to work this direction and this direction. I'm going to work this direction. And sometimes it'll fool you. The grain will change, and you'll have to change. You have to kind of go by the feel of the grain. Here we have a nice curve. We can really tell by the curve where this grain is going to be running out this direction like this. We know that we're going to shave it off that way. It's, it's you know, it's hard to... It's a little bit like peeling a carrot or an apple or a, or a potato, but there you're not, you're not re, it's, there's no resistance. Here you're going to get resistance. If I go back too far, it's going to grab. So now one of the things I do when I start a piece like this is we want a center line. So I'm going to kind of guess. What I suggest you do if, you have, if you're not good at guessing, get yourself a ruler and mark this. And we're going to use that center line as a guide. Because what we want is a nice uniform body. So I'm going to really round this fish from this point to this point, and this one to this one, so that oh shoot, there we go. There's a nice front view. So that from that front view, it's nice and even. Okay, we've got our fish marked. We know the grain, we know the direction we want to go, and now we want to secure our work. We want it safe. So I want both hands on the, on the wood, so, or on the tools, not on the wood. So I'm gonna use a bar clamp, an old bar clamp. I'm gonna mount this on my bench here. I'm gonna go just a little bit. I want it nice and secure. Just, just stay away from that line, that center line that I marked, so I can work from that over. That's good. You might have a more modern clamp, a quick grip clamp, a C clamp. Um, you can find these at the hardware store to secure your work. Any of those will work. So now that my work is secure, like I said, I'm going to work from that line this direction. And so I have um, a, uh, my, about a three quarter inch gouge here, and we're just going to start taking some wood away. It goes pretty quickly, really, depending on the size of the gouge you have. If you were doing this by hand with a knife, it's going to go a little slower. And some, of you, some of you will say, well, I don't have a bench at home to work from. Um, I have done this on a dining room table. If you put a mat down, you can get rubber mats like, a, let's see, I'm, I'm going to stay behind this and go ahead and work from that point to that line. And I'm working towards the nose of the fish. There's rubber mats you can get for shelf liners in the store, and they work. You can put that on your, on your table and you put a little piece of wood under here and clamp it down. And that gives you some, you know, some stability. Okay, I'm gonna take this loose, we'll flip around. I'm gonna do half of it really fast and I'll show you where we're going with it. Now I'm just really taking that corner off. 
and working from that wine to where that other center wine was, and creating just kind of a nice curve there. The tool marks I'm not so worried about. I can go with something smoother and I can take some of those off. I have wider tools that I could use. Or we could take a knife, and I'm gonna show you that with a knife. We can smooth it that way too. Now we have two square corners that we don't know what to do with. We worked both directions. So I'm gonna go, now is when we're gonna get impatient. I wanna take that out like that. That's where it chips. We don't want that. We're still gonna have to consider that we have to work both directions. Keep redrawing your center lines. Use those as guides. You don't have to use a pen. I'm using a pen so you can see it. Pencil works just fine. Well, those quadrants help you visualize where you're at. Now we can see those lines. And by taking some of this off, we start seeing that roundness here. And this gives us a chance to see whether these are even or not. Now, they're, they're, they're not perfectly even yet, but we get, you know, we get a start. What we're shooting for is more taper like this. We want that to be uh, you know, more rounded. We want it to be more even. And keep working all four sides. When I use a knife, I want to hold it in the, in the, in the grip of my fingers right here. Or I'll take this smaller one. I'm using my fingers to control that knife. In fact, I can leave the guard on it. This is how I'm working it. I'm working it right there with my hands, with my knuckles. And so you see me drawing really fast towards my hand, but I can control this quite a bit by going, just, just going slowly. Because the knife's not going to go anywhere any more than I squeeze my hand. My thumb's out of the way. And when I, if you notice, when I, when I roll my fingers, the knife comes in an arch. It rolls in an arch. That's how your hands work. It's not coming straight at me. But if I do this, which is what people want to do, they want to pull this way. They don't have any control over it. When the knife lets, lets go of the wood, it just, there's just a, it's like trying to stop your car. It doesn't just stop. It rolls a little bit. Well, the knife blades can do the same thing. Or when you're carving like this, you know, once it releases, you have this much space that you're shooting out in space with a, with a blade. I always have control of that knife. I'm either holding onto it and rolling that knife towards me or the other cut I use is what I call a push cut. And as I'm holding that piece, and my, this is against my thumb, the back of the blade is against my thumb, and I'm using this thumb, not this hand. This hand's just supporting the knife. This thumb's gonna do the work. And it's hard to get used to doing that. That's gonna push that blade through there. So once I get practice, I can go very quickly. And it looks like my right hand's doing the work, but it's not. The left hand's doing all the pushing. The right hand is just keeping it against my left hand to create stability. This way, I'm not freehanding. I'm only going as far as my thumb can push. So there's complete control there. My hand's away from it. The blade's not over here. By, this, by the corner of my hand here, I have nothing to get, no way to really get cut as long as my hands are behind the blade. Now here, my thumb is in the road, but I'm not coming clear up to it. So there's two different ways. I've taken it off with a gouge, and I've taken it off with a knife. And the gouge is a little slower, or I'm mean, sorry, the knife's a little slower. So we can go back and we can use that gouge again just to show you. I don't have it tight. He's getting a round belly, like me. I love that sound. When the tools are nice and sharp, they just slice through that wood like butter. Not all wood is like that. Some you'll really fight or you'll have to use a mallet. That really, really sharp tool really is what makes the difference.
So there's my center line. I'm going to work my way up to it. I'm going to look down on my fish here and even him up. And I went over this piece and took the sanding mark or the gouge marks off. You might want to leave the gouge or the top tool marks. You like, you know, might like those. Some people do. Where was this one? I took the, the rasp and I worked over it and took all that off and smoothed it up a little bit. Coarse side and smooth side. Again, just the lumber yard fine. You can get these over in the lumber yard. Didn't have to be super detailed, but it smoothed it up a little bit, shaped it, and now we're ready to do the detail. Okay, we have our fish body all figured out, all shaped up, all smoothed up. And I took the one that was finished, and I'm going to show you how I lay the eyes and the face on it. One way to do it is I go to Google and I'll find like a profile of something, or if I, I'll find several pictures of what I need. There are even companies that sell castings, if you want to get really detailed, of actual fish heads and bird heads and things like that where you can get a resin casting if you want to get that detailed. But we're making a decoy, so I'm going to keep this simple. So I'm going to draw on the, the gill cover, or the, or, the, or the mouth cover here, which is just kind of a little tab right here over his mouth. And his eye sets in right about here. And that's where that center line worked. I'm going to do the other side. And I'm going to kind of do it from the top a little bit so I can kind of tell where I'm at. And then his gill covers come in. Here and here, we're just going to put a couple of them in. We don't need to get real super detailed. We're not carving the fuzzy little gills and stuff. We're just going to represent the details. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that knife again. And I'm going to do what we call a stop cut. And a stop cut is I'm just going to draw a line. I'm using that knife just like I was, I was, I was carving with the blade towards me. Now I've got the blade away from me. And I'm going to rest my thumb here and use it as a guide. And I'm going to press that knife down in that cut and, and just draw it backwards to this point here and stop. You can also do it like a pencil. If you do, I want you to keep your hands out of the way. We're going to hold on to that fish. I'm using the bench as a guide. And this is a smaller cut. But see, I've got control of it like a pencil or a pen. You can do this left or right handed. And I'm going to just draw it back here and make a cut like so. I'm going to do one on the other side. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach this, whatever's comfortable for you. Nothing's going to be comfortable at first because you're, learning, you're new and it's going to feel awkward. But it will get more comfortable. And then it's a curved. So I'm going to slowly walk my way around and stop. Now I'm going to take that knife and I'm going to lay it down. And I'm going to come up to that point and that chip pops out. I'm going to lay it down here and come up to that point and that chip pops out. I want to go real gently, real carefully because I, I don't want to cut this piece off. If you cut it off, you go a little deeper. And then I'm going to do that push cut. I'll work up to that point. And since it's on a curve, I'd come out a couple of different times. Take the point on that knife and walk work that out of there. And I'm going to go over it just a little bit to get that pencil line off so you can see it. And really, what we want to do is kind of create a little shadow. It's there, this little piece is so thin and lays so tight to the fish's body, you barely see it. Most people hardly even notice it's there. I want it to stand out a little bit since I'm making a decoy. I want it to be prominent. Then I narrow up the lower jaw a little. I'm going to take just a little bit off this edge here, where the upper lip is. So now we have that cover, see, that little piece is right there. That works really well. Now what I'm going to use for the eye, and I may have to adjust it a little bit. This is a number nine gadget in about a three-eighths. A number nine means it's, it's a deeper curve. 
I talked about the one I had earlier, was, I think it was a five. As the numbers go up, they go from one to 11. And uh, they, uh, each time they get a little deeper. 11's the deepest. So I'm gonna take that nine, I'm gonna lay that right there, straight up and down. I'm gonna walk that around that eye. And now the same thing on this eye, what we have to do, <clears throat> as this grain, I have to go this direction and then this direction, or I'll chip it out. And this way and this way, towards. So I'm gonna come back a little bit, use the point of my knife. Get that eye to stand out. Clean up the little fuzzies in there. And then I can just real carefully round the edge of that, that eyeball. I got a little fuzzy spot right here in front. There it goes, came out. Now the eye stands out. Now it's gonna stand out more when I paint it. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the gills that I did on this one. I'm gonna make a, a sharp cut along here. I'm gonna take that gill out. Or that background area around the gill. And then we're gonna do another one. So just for a decoy, this is pretty simple. All right, there we go. Now we have the basic, we have the basic shape there. We got the mouth cover, the eye, the gills. Now we can smooth this out a little bit, so it's not so harsh. Blend this a little bit. So. The other side will be carved the same way. And we'll bring those together. And you use your, make sure you use your center lines. Make sure you guide off of those. Um, match your eyes up and your mouth cover up. And you should have a fairly believable fish. I think that works. What do you think? There we go. Next, we'll do the fins. Okay, we're back, and we are going to work on some fins. Um, this is the one I had sitting out here earlier. I, the fins aren't done. They're just kind of popped into place for the time being to give you an idea where they go. It gave me a chance to cut them out. I cut them out with a bandsaw. I had told you earlier that when we cut the fish out from that raw block, we wanted to save those pieces, and that's what we're going to save them for. Um, I drew a line here and here and guessed the width and what I do is I cut that off. I'll cut a couple of strips out of there. And I laid my fins out on that. It gave me something to use to create fins. So I'm able to save some scrap wood <clears throat> and reutilize it. So I've cut these out on the bandsaw. I've tried to run them with the grain on the smaller fins. The grain, like we talked about, those long, that, that long grain in that piece of wood runs through the fin this way so it doesn't break. But for the demonstration, um, I ran the grain through, directly through the, the direction of the fin for most purposes. Um, I used a Dremel to cut the slot out of here. You can do this by hand. This one is real, real tight. This is a number 10, almost a U shape. And you'd have to just do it a little bit at a time like we did the gill cover. You, you know, just put it in there, use your knife, cut on both sides punch the ends, and then go in back in with a gouge and hollow this out to the width that your, your, your piece is going to be. First, I just kind of took some, some wood off of both sides. And here's where I want to control that knife, because it's a really small piece. 
and I don't want it to break. See, now, my, now I can feel, I can't see the grain as well, but I can feel where it's grabbing. See, my chips aren't coming out. I just want to stop there. And I can pull, if I keep pulling, they're gonna pop off, but it's gonna chip. That's one of those places where you, I was telling you about the grain, will, they'll kind of stop you. See, I'm going deeper and then you wanna stop. So I wanna turn that around. We're gonna come this way. The grain changes even in that little tiny piece. Now it's, now it's the slow part, when it's really a matter of thinning these down, making these fit in place. I'm only going to be able to do a couple of them for you. But in the end, we'll show you what this looks like. So I had to drill holes where the dorsal, or the, or the, uh, the breast fins fit in. And I have those where they fit. Then it's a matter of shaping that fin like I did here. taking it down. Each one is just, it's the same basic process. I'm just going to thin it thinner and thinner. I don't want to get it paper thin. I just want to get some shape to it so it looks a little bit more like a fin. And then this will just get glued in with wood glue. And I'll do the appropriate fin for each one of these and add the tail. The tail is still pretty bulky here, but it would get shaped and put in. By the time when we're all done, the little guy stands up on the table. And these two fins lay more to the body. So these three are the what he's resting on. And you have a decorative decoy. And that's it. See you next time on Lemon Tree Wood Carving. <laughs>